The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. International jet setting uh, Kev Mullins, at this moment, as you're listening to this show, if you're listening on the day that it was designed to be listened to, is on a jetliner, first class, of course, tra- <laughs> travelling back from Japan. What did you see, Kev? Tell us. <laughs> well, that's quite a difficult thing to answer. I saw uh, Japan. <laughs> Guess we're doing this in the past. <laughs> yeah, uh, what I'm doing is I'm pushing you on the on the. What did you really see, Kev? Well, so in in reality, what we'll 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 have seen is uh, the fact we've done a factory <laughs> tour, yeah. and uh, we will have had the chance to speak to some of the product planners yeah. and managers yeah. and all of that good stuff. Uh, it's a real shame the timings didn't work for you as well. Cause it would oh, be, I know. Never mind. You'd have loved it. Well, I, I would they have had done. a big poster of you up in the in the big square there. What? Yeah, <laughs> it was there. There was there was all these people. That, um, <laughs> it was like a riot, basically, in the middle of Tokyo, yeah. saying, we, now, want now, we want Neil. We I, want Neil. Now I really don't believe you. I was... I was really looking forward to going to Japan and Andreas was good for his word and we had dates all sorted out but then things had to had to move and shift and stuff a bit and uh, well I'm um, quite simply a wedding prevented me from going and you've got to uh, you've got to honor your wedding booking so uh, so I shot the wedding while you um, sat in a hot tub in the middle of Tokyo <laughs> I'm not letting hot tubs got tattoos what the fuji cast what has that got to do with being in a they don't like tattoos in public spaces. Is that right? Is that the way it works in Japan? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I kind of don't disagree with it, to be totally honest with you. Even though I have tattoos, I, I um, yeah, that's that's their prerogative. They don't particularly. I don't think it's like illegal, but it's mm. it's certainly uh, the, uh, one of the previous times I went to Japan, we went to a um, a retreat up in the mountains, yeah. and they had hot springs. Um, and it was a, uh, and it, it was a little bit Norwegian in its approach, i.e., you know, you don't wear anything, um, <laughs> right. which, which immediately made me nervous. And then I became immediately unnervous when I saw the sign that said, no tattoos allowed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a get out of jail card then, wasn't it? it? Was. Uh, right. Well, welcome to the Fuji cast, uh, our fortnightly show. And of course, in between, we do the. Uh, the patron show as well. Um, today we have uh, second part of Robin Morgan. We are going to deal, whether you like it or not, with NFTs, Kev. Maybe one of your tattoos could be an NFT. Take a picture, stuff it up. You might have, you might, you might have a bit of artwork there, Kev, that could be worth millions, Del Boy. Mm. So we're doing that, uh, and also your questions going into uh, Facebook and. Uh, and the, and the email address click at fujicast.co.uk that is what is on the show um and we should mention uh, are we mentioning pick time again kev yeah yeah of, why not of course we are right pick time pick hyphen time uh, dot com uh, if you want to uh, show your work in, in the way that uh, myself and kev do we both use it we we're both strong advocates of uh, pick time who are supporting this show um the the it's just I, I found the cleanest way to display work to my clients, whether it's commercial clients, wedding clients, portrait clients, whatever, after the job. I like it because you can you, you can sort out a – it's a website-style design, really, isn't it, the, the display that they look at and, and the decisions you make for what pictures are the, if you like, the hero images, et cetera. It's a really good way of displaying your work. And, and of course, that, Kev, leads to – Ding sales. Yeah, absolutely. It's just beautiful, isn't it? You know, we've, we've said about it over the last couple of weeks. And uh, uh, as you may or may not know, if it's the first time listening, you can get a, a one month free using the code FUJICAST, all in uppercase. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, that has probably been definitely one of the, the best things to come out of lockdown, essentially, was my, when I had time to look at pick time and thought, yeah, I'm going to migrate all my old galleries across um, and I just got on with it and did it, and it is just, yeah, it just looks smarter, it integrates better, the sales, the marketing, everything about it is 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 a hundred percent spot on. I mean, it even does little things like, uh, you know, you can you can request um, uh, testimonials and stuff like that, and then you can link those testimonials direct to your website. You can give them little nudges. All it's it's just it's just a very very well thought out, very clean interface. Yeah. Um, done by created by some very very clever people. Well, very artistic people as well. So, and and if you want to um, have your own pick time 
uh, gallery and a way of selling. And of course, um, we should mention as well that depending upon the package you buy, it becomes the ultimate backup, doesn't it? So you can retain all your all your jobs on there and never have to worry about them disappearing. So uh, yeah, you can if you go to pick-time.com and on checkout, use the um, all capital letters, use the word FUJICAST. Indeed. And you are yes. good to go. Join us. For a revolution. Oh, by the way. That film. Uh, what was that film? It was a horrible film. Oh. Horror. It was the first horror film, I think, that was banned in the UK. Was it called Evil Dead? Evil. De- was Evil Dead banned in the UK? Yeah, it was for a bit. Was it? All I remember about it, because I was a little kid, all I remember about it is the zombies would come up to the window and, and go, join us. Oh, yeah, like you are right. <laughs> and my sister used to do that to me when I was a kid. She, oh. she would like... She she'd go out the back garden and and pop her head at the window and go. Join! I used to terrify the hell out of me. Whisper, join us through your window. God, <laughs> have you got a good relationship with your sister now? I do. I love it a bit, actually, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, not was, then. No. <laughs> <laughs> when I lived in a, a little cottage between the practice marriage and the real one, I, it was a little cottage. I, I put myself in a little cottage on a moor, almost right out in the middle of nowhere. Because I thought it would be good for my uh, my soul, but it wasn't really because I was really scared of all the noises that happen at night in the countryside. The countryside is not a quiet place, by the way, Kev. It's no. really no, it's noisy, not. and yeah. uh, it was only a couple of nights into my uh, into my lo- lonely new existence that one night I heard this this <sighs> going on outside. I thought, what is that? And that, yeah, I suppose that's a bit evil dead. And I am, you know me, I like to watch a horror movie. So my imagination started ticking over immediately. What was it then? It was a badger, badger mating. <laughs> These are the noises they make. And in the, mo- in the morning, I saw the farmer who lived along the way. And I said, there's a noise um, I heard last night. And I, I had to describe this noise, heavy breathed at the farmer, Farmer Nigel. And he said, oh, don't worry about that. That's badgers mating. <laughs> thought, how much of this is going to happen? So, uh, oh, or it could have been your sister. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> right, question. I mean, her husband is a little bit grey, but I wouldn't call him a badger. <laughs> right, let's go for questions. Do you want to start with Facebook? Because I think we had a few more questions into the Book of Face, didn't we? I will, indeed. And uh, traditionally, I will start with the latest one added, which was exactly 21 hours ago. Paul Stevenson. I haven't read this yet, so it's quite a long one. Hi, Kev. Hi, Neil. Long-time listener. First-time questioner. Yada, yada, yada. Maybe more of a discussion, but here we go. Often clients will choose to share photos of their big day on social media, set as a phone lock screen as well as print, with Instagram's image ratio of 4 by 3 or 1 by one a phone screens at 16 by 9 or similar and printing at traditional ratios. Do you think there is a need for supplying photos in these ratios specifically for these needs? Oh, um, he then goes on to say he doesn't do that himself, but it's something he's considering. Uh, as a side note, do you get annoyed seeing your images recropped by social platforms, especially if anti Moore is chopped off the side of an image? Mm. Keep up the good fight, Paul. At the bearded man photography. <laughs> Here's my answer. <sighs> <laughs> I do. I suppose. I suppose um, seeing your work cropped is not as unusual as it used to be, and I don't get as agitated for that reason, because I've I've gotten used to the fact that different programs, different websites, different blogs, Instagram, whatever, crop you. I'm not as impatient about it or antsy about it as I used to be. You? No, I'm not at all. No. I have to say. I mean it. It bothers me. It, well, it doesn't bother me, but it does annoy me slightly when I'm uploading to Instagram and, uh, you know, I have a, I do like 10 pictures or something. I don't know what they call those. It's not a real, it's not a story. Carousel? Yeah, whatever. When you stick 10 pictures up and then you have to kind of move it around a little bit to get the best crop. Cause I, 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 oh no, actually that's, that's rubbish really, because I always end up clicking that little thing that, that says set it yeah, to the same ratio, yes, the original right. ratio. So I have my borders at the top and bottom. So, Sometimes if it works, if all 10 of them, if I can get a good square crop out of all 10 of them, then I'll do that. Um, otherwise, I'll just go by the three by two. So mm. that's the only thing. It does not bother me when clients do it, particularly that's it's entire. Once I've taken the pictures and given it to them, it's entirely up to them what they do with it. Um, I don't generally see that anyway. And no, I certainly don't think about it when I'm editing or when I'm shooting. I mean, I, I, I very, 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 very infrequently shoot vertically 
uh, it's very rare for me to twist my camera around. Yeah. Um, so I, it just doesn't cross my mind. It's, it's just, no, I, it, it's just something else for somebody else to worry about. Not well, me. I was looking through, um, a, a gallery the other day and I, but making a photo film, so I had a, a quick look at all the ones. So I usually delete the ones that are vertical because it doesn't work in a film. But I, I noticed that probably in a wedding now, only six or seven shots will be portrait at most. I might do six or seven a year. Really? That low? Yeah. I mean, mm. really, the only time I do it is when I'm trying to get the shot of the back of the bride's dress, you, if they're in the garden mm. or, you know, yeah. like wandering around the, yeah. the, the wedding. And I try and get a shot of the, the, the bride's dress. But even that, if I'm back far enough, will be horizontal. But if I can, you know, that, yeah, that's, that's really it. I honestly, looking at the images that I shot because I had the wedding yesterday and there's not one vertical image. Not one. No. Well, I mean, it is the uh, the way our eyes see, isn't oh, it? No, hang on. Oh. I tell a lie. There is one. What one? Just before they walk back up the aisle after oh. the registrar has done their registrar in and they stand, <laughs> they're standing waiting to be released. To be released. Uh, it's not, a, it's not a prison release, Kev. It's I've a wedding. Got, I tell you what, I did a wedding a couple of weeks ago <laughs> where, and it was a lovely wedding. It was actually at my, my local, ch- the church I go to, at St. Aldham's in Malmesbury. Mm. Um, and it was, it was, um, Deacon Steve, who's actually a friend of mine. And, and he, he did our do, our thingy, me and Gemma's. As oh, well, yeah. Yeah. Last year. Yeah. Um, and I know him really well. And he, and he's such a good orator. Now, I've never, in all of the years I've, I've hear, been hearing him speak, I've never heard him say, um, or ah, or anything like that. Anyway, he, at the end of the ceremony, he did his final blessing and he, he said something really nice to them. He, he said, now turn around. Your future is that way. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. And sent them off. <laughs> I thought that was absolutely brilliant. He just pointed at the back doors and he said, your future is that way. <laughs> I'm writing that down, Kev. Uh, great, your, isn't it? Your future yeah. is that way. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lovely story. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's a really nice guy. And, and you know, he, he the way he said, the way he speaks as well is, is brilliant. Yeah. So anyway, what were we talking about? Vertical images. Vertical images. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I, I'm more than happy to let clients resize they're going to at some stage and i think if you get i mean i don't really want to get involved in having to do many different ratio crops that would just make the uh certainly in a in a job where you've got 400 plus images take forever kev yeah i think if you know i i, I get the question i do get the question of course i do but i i just think it's an added if i was to be you know offering if i was to say to clients you know i'll give you 50 images or 10 images that are Instagram ready, yeah. then I'd want to be charging for that service. How much would you charge? A million pound, because I don't <laughs> want to do it. <laughs> no, try and think of a reasonable figure, Kev, that you think it might be worth. I, I would think, you know, I'd be looking at probably adding £500 to the fee. For, for, that. for, for how because many? It, cha- it changes my way of thinking. Right. It changes my way of thinking, the way of doing things. I would have to, you know, on my little notes that I've written on the back of my hand, I'd have to add another one, little one that says, don't forget Instagram <laughs> images. <laughs> No, 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 uh, well, no, no. I'm, I'm not suggesting you, you shoot in a different way. We're talking about. I think the question is, you know, taking the images that you have shot and then Instagramizing them. How much would you charge for five or six images? Oh, well, it's not worth. I wouldn't charge for that. I mean, because I just leave that up to them to do it. Right. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, the, you know, uh, I think the idea of kind of editing and cropping to sixteen by nine during the edit and supplying them as separate images for Instagram. That's a service. Oh, Just yeah. giving them the yeah. same images and saying to them, you can crop that if you want. That's, okay. that's a different thing. And talking of sayings and things that, um, well, this is entirely different to your vicar there, Vicar Steve. De- he's a deacon. Deacon, sorry, deacon. deacon not vicar. and deacon. No, I know. But Man United and Liverpool. Is it? No, never the twain <laughs> shall meet. <laughs> is it a bit like that? Oh, God. No. Um, I heard a, a great expression the other day about a horrible event of the last couple of years. I was speaking to a photographer um, who t- makes these extraordinary art installations about nature with his with his wife. There's an, uh, they're an artist duo, and his um, his name is Matthias. and And Matthias said, um, "He said COVID is a direct invoice from nature." And I thought, "Wow, yeah, that's a good statement, isn't it?" <laughs> so there we go. He and the yeah. deacon, he and the deacon could could while away many hours thinking of great great things to say. But you but you know what we 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 will we've paid that invoice the society. Well, we're still paying the have invoice. We? I don't I, I don't know that we have. Well, we're paying. We're still paying for it. We paid for most of it. Right. Um, but what we won't do is learn where that invoice came from and think, oh, I don't want that invoice again. What should I do to avoid that invoice happening again? What we'll do is we'll just go. 
Oh, right, we'll pay that invoice off and then we'll get even greedier and we'll ruin the world even more and the rich men will get richer and the rich women will get richer and the rest of the world can just suffer. And then the next massive invoice will come and I suspect it will be even bigger. I'll drink to that, Kev. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you anyway, always make me feel have so, have a nice day. <laughs> so much better when I talk to you. <laughs> uh, but I, I did think that was a good expression, but you're right. Oh, and uh, of course, in the UK, we've just had the news that we're going to have blackouts, Kev. Blackouts in the winter. Well, no, come on. That's, you, this, you, you're ex-BBC. You shouldn't be glorifying this <laughs> because what it says is in the absolute worst case scenario, which they do not think will happen. Who said that? <laughs> EDF or whoever it was. No, not no, the National Grid. Did they say that? It won't happen. Yes. Oh, that's all right. Yes. Then. I thought well, that they didn't say it wouldn't happen. They said it in the absolute worst case scenario, but they do not expect it to happen. I thought it was the Blunder Trust that said that. That's why I wasn't quite believing it. But no. Oh no, I don't. I don't. I, I no. I, I can't, okay. can't actually listen to too much. <laughs> right? Anyway. Should we move on? Oh, by yes, the way, please. there was a little message here about the time you spent in Norway uh, from Nut Heishalt, uh, who said, "Don't go getting a speeding ticket in Norway, Kev. The fine mm. is easily seven hundred GPP. G GBP." Yes. No, it can't be seven hundred quid. Well, I don't know. I didn't speed in Norway though, because somebody had warned me that they're not very. They don't particularly like it. What I did do though was I was very proud of my driving um, throughout the places I drove, yeah. and then when I was coming back to the airport, you know the, you, that panic bit. Where's the where's the rental return? Where's the yeah. rental return? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I got to the roundabout and uh, I saw car park, and so I kind of thought about heading there. And then realised that that's just a normal car park, like drop off. And I thought, oh no! And I panicked. And what I did was I drove around the wrong way, around the roundabout, and then I drove the wrong way up the emergency ramp of the airport. Oh my god! I had a lot of people beeping at me. That's fourteen hundred GBP. <laughs> I hope there's no cameras on that. Yeah. Well, there will be, Kev. There's always cameras at airports. Yeah. I tell you what, though, I can't be the first person ever to have no. panicked at that point at an airport. Mm. That's for sure. I did have a, a moment. Uh, like that when I was leaving France for my long, 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 long journey from the south. The very first thing that I did was pull out in the in the village. It was teeming with rain when I left. Completely forgot what country I was in and turned onto uh, oncoming traffic in the wrong side of the road. I had a very, very angry couple of French drivers beeping their horns and flashing and stuff. Yeah, it's easy to do. Gotta be careful. Right. Next question. Um... This is from Dirk Van Hal. I'm very glad you decided on a fortnightly release schedule. I'm looking forward to listening to you three times in October. Mm -hmm. Does I'm it work dick. out the three times in October then, does it? Yeah. Oh, see, I told you this would happen. What happens when there's a week with three? <laughs> or a month with three. A month with five weeks. Yeah. Although it's good for a mortgage. It's good for my mortgage anyway. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, a mortgage weekly. How, how, how did you guys learn what you know about your cameras? I upgraded from my old Canon EOS 600D to the Fujifilm X-S10 at the end of last year. Came with a basic manual to get you started, but uh, for more detailed information, you really do need to download the owner's manual. I use it on my phone whenever I want to look up something quickly, but the screen is too small to use to study all those new features on my camera. It's a lot easier to read on a computer screen, but it's more difficult to try those features out when you're stuck to a desk. Any advice for a new Fuji shooter how to better understand how his camera works. I can tell you, Dirk, what you do is you go to your, your phone and you go, here we go, this this will show whether he's turned his phone off or not. And you go to that one and then you press this button. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. His phone is on in the background, just about. And then your problem... Hello, hello, is that, is, hello this is camera support. <laughs> Help desk. Is that, is that Neil, my number one customer speaking? <laughs> and Dirk, that's the way to solve all your problems. You don't need a manual, you need a Kev. <laughs> uh, no, it's a valid point though, isn't it? The manuals are pretty poor. What I tend to do, I mean, I'm, it, it's difficult, it's different for me because I pretty much know every menu inside out and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Although on the newer generation of cameras, XH, XH2S and all that kind of stuff, there is a whole load of new stuff. Yeah. I'm a creature of habit, so I, my my modern cameras, if you like, are, are set up pretty much the same way as all my old ones ever were. Yeah. Um, and then it, I just spend time going through the menus and you know figuring out and you know if there's anything that I don't understand in the menu, like there's a new menu entry or something, I just bang it into Google and just see what comes up. And somebody else has usually got there first, but yeah, the manuals are not great. 
I have to say. Um, there used to be a time, I, d- I did one for the um, X100S, wrote a, a, a book that was published. There used to be time when people, they would do that, but you don't get those books these days, or certainly not many of them, because, you know, YouTube, and it's just not worth the publisher's while to do those kind of books. So, um, but yeah, you might you might be lucky and find a pub, somebody published a, you know, how to use such and such camera book. Well, otherwise, it's YouTube, isn't it? The yeah. um, It's fairly intuitive with each model that comes along. There's not so many new things that you completely flawed. But of course, if you are a new user, then yes, you are hitting the ground running, as it were, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. And, and I totally understand if you come from a different system, you know, if you're coming from Canon or, or um, Sony or something, you know, if you come from Canon and you, you go to Fujifilm, you're going to be thinking, oh, my word, mm. you know, these are very different. If you come from Sony and you go to Fujifilm, you're going to be thinking, wow, these are great. Look at all that. Look how clean these menus are. Kevin. There you go. Right. Facebook. Yes. Uh, okay. Wade Brown. Good day from Perth. And then he says, if you want to say some more fun Aussie town names like Wollongong, did we have the answer? Somebody sent us the answer to that. Did oh, I did we get the right? answer to that? Did I get it entirely wrong? I did, didn't I? I don't know. Yeah, I can't remember. Anyway, we have Wagga Wagga, Booty yeah. Booty, yeah. Mangaketa Tang, yeah. or you could just try saying Manjuk or Dap, which is just a street name in Perth. Anyway, <laughs> my question relates to both of your editing process. Is there a certain order you follow each time you start editing, i.e. fix exposure, change white balance, apply a preset, or do you apply a preset first? Mm. Does the process change each time you do it and depends on the specific photo? Well, as king of making presets, I'm sure you will have thoughts on this. I, I've always just, um, the first thing I do is correct exposure. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe white balance if it looks entirely off and then apply preset. Yeah, basically presets are good, but you need to get your exposure right first. Mm. Um a good preset shouldn't be adjusting things like exposure, shadows, highlights, all that kind of stuff, no, and white balance. No. Um, so do all of that first. That's the way I do it. So I, I bring everything into Lightroom. I have my smart collection set up, and which will group everything by their ISO range. I do my noise reduction, bang those in quickly in the in a group in. Then I do my, then I go through each image, uh, white balance, exposure, that kind of stuff. Mm. Get that done. Then I um, whack on my color preset. Then uh, sorry. Before I do that, then I create virtual copies. So I have two two sets of everything. First set, I bang on the color preset. Second set, I bang on the black and white preset. So hang on a minute, you, you you do that that process first of all, though. You do, you 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 uh, get your copies right at the, the head of the show, don't you? You do all of the exposure correction first. Oh right, before you make thing. a virtual yeah, because copy. Your exposure correction and your white balance is just as important for your black and white as it is for your color. Yes. Yeah. So do all of that first. Then, if you're going to be doing color and black and white of the same image, then create your virtual copies. Then bang your presets on. Is there? A, um, we've talked about this, but people join us all the time, so I need to remember that. Is there any reason why you do now present both color and black and white? Because it's not that long ago that um, we were having a discussion about client has to trust us that. We're going to turn things into black and white that suit, mm-hmm. uh, and so it was. There was a sort of a, a trust relationship going on before, but now you don't do it that way. No. So um, yeah, my clients get one of everything, color and black and white, and the reason for that is because it's very easy, like really easy for me to do it, and it avoids any of those those questions that might come up later. Like, I didn't really get many of those, but I had my fair share of them. Mm. Uh, you know, if, if you, my mum wants the one of a dress in colour, blah, blah, blah. But also, it, it's a good marketing angle mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Well, in, in that it's a package you charge more money for? No, no, no. I don't charge more for it. But I, in fact, I charge less. If people want just black and white, I give them a discount. Hmm. But I don't charge more for the, you know, just generally giving them colour and black and white. It's like an extra half an hour for me. Yeah. But what I do do is in my packages, it's it's there as a, you will get everything in colour and black and white. And oh. you know, I can almost hear them go, ooh. So for 400-ish images for a wedding. Mm -hmm. How how long should that take somebody who's, you know, like yourself, develop presets, pretty adept at uh, at, uh, not rushing, but but being brisk in terms of business with your edit? How long should it take? Well, I mean... you know, it is very, it's different because of different styles, I think. As a, as a kind of documentary photographer who has very few editorial group shots, that kind of thing, I don't need, I'm um, certainly no portraits. Uh, you know, those kind of things often take people longer to edit. Yeah. I, I, I get disappointed in myself if an edit, you know, from start to finish, if I sit down and I, I start and I don't do anything else from start to finish, takes more than like four hours. Right. Um, that doesn't mean it always does that. 
quite often I'm disappointed in myself really yeah. that way. But yeah, that's that's kind of my target for your average wedding. But yeah. sometimes it's different. Some you know, sometimes it's more challenging. The light is more challenging as we move into winter. You know, they will take longer for sure because there's more um, you know darker images, more noise to to deal with. And uh, you know, I found I, I certainly find that yesterday, for example, was the first wedding that I shot where it was you know it was reasonably dark early you know kind of late afternoon ish kind of thing. It was it was getting darker, yeah. and that. I adjust the way that I think at the wedding then as well as as, as well as knowing that the editing will be slightly different when you're turning things into uh, just asking for a friend when you're when you're turning things into color and black and white I, I've always this sort of ingrained in me um, if you forgive the pun that sometimes black and white is more forgiving for, for instance I'm editing a wedding at the moment where if I produced some of the the pictures in color I, I'd be really fighting with this awful backlight and and the sensor going helter skelter with everything whereas in black and white they look beautiful they yeah contrast and tone and it, it just it it looks i wouldn't want to give that image in color and i wonder whether you get moments like that yeah occasionally um but yes you're right i mean some images do look better in black and white but then some images look better in color so well, I get you know, that. it's just the moments where because color is less forgiving in the edit stage digitally i find that, that, that there are moments where you think no it's not just bang it into black and white for the sake of it but it's bang it into black and white because you know you can make a darn fine image of this and it's going to look a bit ropey in color yeah absolutely but you but don't get that opportunity do you really you, you have to do both uh yeah but it doesn't you know there's no there's no extra effort involved right. it's just the choice then which one they prefer isn't it yeah i suppose so. um and i typically when i'm doing the photo film will you know we'll pick the ones that look the best obviously yeah, i still use the kind yeah. of islands yeah. of color approach and then the blog post and all that kind of stuff but yeah i mean i just find it's one level of worry and stress removed yeah yeah i get it um say uh, say drinks reception drinks reception say noise reduction noise reduction you have the same problem kev <laughs> I can't <laughs> honestly. I was we saying to it, some, the wedding planner yesterday was talking to me, and I and it, do you know what I said to her? What I said, what's going to happen after? And I hesitated a bit, and she looked at me as they often do, you know, like almost like willing me to finish my sentence. And I went, the cocktail hour. <laughs> I just, it just, I just think about it all the time now. Bring myself to say drinks reception, a cocktail hour. But you, you are Manhattan. Next time I'm watching you on stage doing one of your your, your uh, things, I'm gonna I'm gonna put my hand up and ask you to explain noise reduction. <laughs> Kev, Mr. Mullins, can you explain noise reduction, please? <laughs> can you say noise reduction? Sorry, Kev, I just found another Kevism. Yeah, no, don't worry. Oh, look, I got a missed call from you. <laughs> yeah can you help me with right we've got part two now of our conversation with robin morgan um last time we obviously talked about uh, about iconic images and his company and, and looking after the rights of uh, of those images and the use of them uh, today we'll talk a bit more about that but but actually kev it's time for you now i think to understand nfts You've published uh, many uh, photo books yourself, uh, photo biographies in particular of Frank Sinatra and Elton John caught my eye because there are quite a few celebrities now that are very important photography collectors themselves. Sir Elton John being perhaps, is he the biggest uh, photo collector amongst the celebrity? Uh, amongst the celebrity crowd, perhaps, yeah. yeah. Uh, but he's, but I mean, he's not just a big collector. He's, he's an intelligent collector. He knows exactly what he loves. Yeah. Uh, and more than that, we have a great relationship with Sir Elton's team and Sir Elton. He um, he's very respectful of the photographers he worked with in the past. Uh, I mean, he, he sends them to me. <laughs> uh, but of course, Terry, we have the biggest Elton John archive in the world, mm. and we have it from the the moment he had his breakout at the Troubadour in Los Angeles in seventy one mm. right to the modern day. And when Elton signed to do Rocket Man the movie with Paramount, he just sent everybody at Paramount and said, you've got to go to Iconic Images mm. and you've got to go through their archive and that will tell you exactly what it was like in the day, what I was wearing and how I looked. And they ended up using about a dozen of our photographs in the end credits. Yeah, yeah, I remember that part. There. Yeah, and we're still resourcing that. You know, yeah. I mean, we'll probably be working very closely with Elton's final tour the, when he bids farewell to... Uh, America in uh, in the fall, it'll be doing three concerts at the Dodger Stadium. 
Probably the scene of his greatest triumph, the two greatest rock and roll concerts of all time, Elton John at the Dodgers, two days at the Dodgers. Yeah, amazing. But well, we did that book. Yeah. That's one of the beauties of digitizing an archive. You can actually take Terry O'Neill's photographs, just those two days at the Dodger Stadium and turn that into a book. Or Ed Karef's archive where he photographed the breakout of Iggy Pop. Um, you know, one night at the Whiskey A Go Go is a book. And and this is one of the beauties of our job is that it's not just the big compendiums of uh, you know, the 28 art photographers who work with David Bowie, that's a very successful book of ours, or the re- most recent one, Paul Newman, before that, Elizabeth Taylor, Audrey Hepburn. But publishing loves those moments in, in history. Yeah. So David Bowie's last performance of Siggy Stardust, one night in, in London, behind closed doors, where he was filming a televised special for NBC. Uh, it was literally the last performance of Siggy, uh, and our photographer, Terry O'Neill, was there. Mm. Uh, that last performance is a book because, of course, people love to look at contact sheets as well as you know, the images you select to tell the story from the dressing room to backstage and on stage. Well, while we're talking about contact sheets and, and you know, tangible things that you hold in your, your hand, I mean, you've made the move from, from, from journalist to editor to, and I'm going to use the E word, entrepreneur. Um, <laughs> I like it. Oh, you are. I mean, it's, uh, I, I see. I see a great degree of glee when we talk about the money side. That's what entrepreneurialism is all about. But let's take it to, to, to publishing. You've published a lot of books. But are our books, are these things that I see on my shelf behind me, are they of numbered days? No, absolutely not. I mean, there was a very famous moment in the 90s when the publisher of Dorling Kinsley, a hugely successful publishing empire, um, pronounced the book was dead and started producing books on CD-ROM. Mm. There you go. That tells you exactly what he knew. <laughs> book, books aren't dead. Books are coming back. In fact, there are, post-COVID, books are, uh, through COVID and post-COVID, you know, people are deserting their Kindles and, uh, and, and buying books again. Yeah. You know, we build them out in terms of we choose a book that's a collectible mm. that we can put out there into the marketplace to, to find our collectors who want the book with associated photography. Mm. The David... Bowie book that we did, we produced in a, in a lavish box luxury set. And the 25 photographers who contributed to that book each produced a signed photograph to go with the box set. Uh, we sold that for £38,000. <sighs> but we sell, we, we will do books to the retail market that you find on the bookshelves, but we'll also do limited edition books, collectible books. And as the art market grows and collecting goes, if people are collecting uh, vintage cars and vintage wines, um, why not vintage books? Yeah, absolutely. And that, that will lead me on, by the way, to NFTs in a short while. Um, <laughs> right. Acquisition. Uh, not a word we use very often on this program, but uh, um, today, Iconic Images has been acquired by this American powerhouse, ABG. Authentic Brands Group is what that stands for. What does it mean for you, though, and, and, and the next oh, chapter? It's, it's, it's massive. I mean, Authentic Brands is a brilliant young business. It's going 12, 13 years, but, I mean, they're already worth $15 billion. Yeah. They buy brands, um, Brooks Brothers, Barney's, um, Reebok. Mm. But they also buy the image rights to Muhammad Ali, to Marilyn Monroe, to Elvis Presley. And they buy these image rights, and then they license the images to apparel manufacturers, perfume manufacturers, memorabilia manufacturers. Whiskey, as we've said, yeah. Exactly, but Muhammad Ali is everywhere. Yeah. Uh, 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 but what they, what they didn't have, uh, really, was, was what we had the expertise to investigate and find uh, and deliver IP, while at the same time washing our face, paying our way. So uh, one of the more enjoyable uh, aspects of the takeover has been, you know, literally say to me, go away and look at this archive and tell us who's worth acquiring. One of the, f- one of the first things that happened with the new guys was, is there an archive on the radar that you want to buy? And I, I said, absolutely, I want to buy a very famous archive of Gerard Mankiewicz who um, has probably the most iconic shoot uh, of Jimi Hendrix, mm. of Jimi Hendrix back in 67, which was a perfect dovetail for us because we also had the Ed Kreff archive who photographed Jimi on stage and in private in his breakout in Monterey in 67. So to take a great studio shoot of Jimi Hendrix and match it up with that means that we have probably the finest Jimi Hendrix archive going, and let's face it, he's a legend. But Garrett also, of course, photographed and work with the Rolling Stones right through from their, the point they were a pub band in Richmond to doing their album covers and photographing even their visa photographs for their first trip to America. 
And I told ABG I wanted it. And they said, how much? I told them. They said, go and get it. So Three months later, deal done. So it, it, it feels, feels to me like there's an open checkbook approach now that, that you might have. Well, uh, no, there must, I mean, there must they're, be... They're Ameri- they yeah, must- they're Americans. They're tough. I mean, they're tough negotiators. Yeah, yeah. But they're intelligent. You know, they're, they're intelligent about the IP. They, they, took, they take the long term. And many, many photographers looking to sell their archives today, they're either going in America down the, what they call the gift tax route, where you know, if they find a patron of a university or a museum who will put up the money to buy it for the museum, then that patron can claim it back in, in tax relief. As, a, as gift tax but that's that's dwindling the opportunities because the irs is being tougher and tougher and tougher on valuations and over the past year or so a lot of photographers have been approached by investors and hedge funds to buy their archives and the top line figure sounds exciting until they look at the small print and realize what they're giving away and and how long they have to wait for their money yeah. so we're kind of alone out there at the moment not even getting are buying archives What's significant is that our reputation is such, um, we've always had a view that photography is a family Mm. and we're respectful to the photographers and the archives we buy. (laughs) I can tell you, we did have an approach not long ago. Somebody wanted to put Jimi Hendrix's face on a packet of condoms. We wouldn't do that. Um, Somebody else wanted to put David Bowie's face on socks. We wouldn't do that and so on and so forth. But our reputation is such that photographers come to us now yeah. And it's no longer about how much money they may pocket from a sale. It's very much about the legacy. Yes. Where they're getting to the stage where they're, you know, they're, they're, their families may not be interested. They've got their own lives. Their kids are moving on into their own areas. So they want a legacy. And they, you know, obviously photographers in the 60s, 70s, their 80s, they want their name to live on. They want their art, their photography to be seen 20, 30 years from now. And they see us as custodians as well as acquirers. Are you a prospector as well? Because we've talked about iconic images uh, with a small I and a capital I, but but surely looking ahead, the future of of Iconic and the future of your relationship with ABG will be that you recognise those that are coming up. Yes, to a to a point. It's interesting that you know, everybody's a photographer today. Yeah, and um and and it's interesting to me how many of our photographers love their their, their handhelds, their iPhones, yeah. their, their their Samsungs, and the quality they could do. I mean, you know, one my great friend Ed Kareff, whose archive I acquired last year, uh, he sold everything. The archive to me he sold his house and he equipped a VW camper van and he travels the blue highways of America with satellite TV and, 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 and in, his, in his VW camper van. And he has his wonderful Instagram account. It's called his bucket list trip. And he just photographs every day wherever he is. He, he may be trying to change a tire in, in an arroyo that he's camped out in the night or enjoying himself in the hot baths in the hot springs of, 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 of Desert Springs in California. Or, uh, and, and he uses his iPhone. And he uses his iPhone not just to take photographs, but to edit his photographs. And, and he, he was a great art director as well as a photographer. I mean, from album covers from uh, uh, Eric Clapton to Dolly Parton classic ones, uh, yeah. album covers. So it intrigues me that, that, I mean, Terry O'Neill would hated cameras and hated his phone. He always felt the cameras got in the way. I mean, you know, he saw them just merely as a tool to translate in the same way that a, a painter uses a paintbrush or a fashion designer uses a pair of scissors. Yeah. Terry hated cameras. Lots of photographers love their cameras, love their iPhones. Uh, and it intrigues me that the kids today are using their phones uh, and the technology that the phones have to even greater effect. And I think a, a result of that is is what we've been seeing in the NFT market uh, in, in in the last two years. It, it's a fascinating area, but every every fourteen year old kid out there is, is, yeah. takes a photograph of his bedroom wall and posts it onto an NFT site in the hope of selling it for a few bucks. Well, I, I want I want to talk about NFTs, and this is the yeah. right moment. I, I can sense a nosebleed coming on for for some people <laughs> trying to understand this subject. Um, now, this is an area to you that, that's very important. Please, 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 NFTs and Web three. What are they? Why are they important? How will they affect the future of art? And should I be worried about them? No, you should be worried about them because it's just about they, they will they will not take over the art market. They will just enhance it and increase it yeah um the simple fact is an nft is nothing more than a a share certificate Mm. it's a code you buy a code that has a visual representation in the way that a share certificate once did but if you buy shares today you get you you get an access code that proves your ownership of that share certificate and that's what you trade Uh, an nft is merely that 
that it's a currency. Mm. So should I wish to do an NFT of Brigitte Bardot, I could do it as a one-off and auction it, or I could do it as um, at a lower price. I could do it as a limited edition of a hundred or a thousand, yeah. uh, whoever wanted it. The issue is marketing it and who you market it to. And the simple fact is that the, the, the NFT crypto market you know, is very young. It's 25 to 35. Most of them probably don't know who Brigitte Bardot is or Fade on Away, or some of them will probably still ask today, are any of the Rolling Stones still alive? <laughs> is that crazy? Yeah. I mean, they're much more into a, a contemporary thing, which is why we're seeing people buying cartoon monkeys for you know hundreds of thousands of dollars. But it's the early days. It's the Klondike. It's the gold rush. An awful lot of people are going to lose money. But the, the way the market is going uh, is in the next two years, we will see an awful lot of the rubbish in the NFT market, the rubbish art, disappear completely. And people will be buying curated art. And you will see a rise in that curated art and the quality of it. So you see a maturing of this this market. Absolutely, yeah. The, and, and most of the crypto market sees that the people are playing in it. You'll, we're seeing hedge funds buying into it. Currently, they're looking to, they always look to diversify, but you know, if they've got a hundred million dollars in a hedge fund, which is not much for a hedge fund, they might decide to put half a million uh, of those dollars uh, into NFTs just to see where they go. And they'll research that market just like they're researching a, a new company. So an NFT image as such is an image that's been placed in, a, in some sort of bank um, yeah. that then has a share It's up there, a share, it's up there in the cloud. A share certificate of value, yeah. yeah. Just, like, just like it's up there in the, your, 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 your Bitcoin or Ethereum, yeah. your, your cryptocurrency is up there in the cloud and you have a code to access it. And Web3? Well, Web3 is interesting. It's, I think they're calling it the merge moment. I mean, a lot of people are saying that NFTs are eating up power in, from the environment because you're constantly churning the powers, constantly eat, churning the servers that keep them afloat. But that's, that's going to evaporate as, as, uh, over the next year or so. Web3 and the merge will find will, 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 will be powered by much more um, climate-friendly servers. Uh, so that um, that that anti-environmental aspect of it will disappear. Yeah. I think um, there's no doubt that governments are looking uh, how can they control, regulate cryptocurrency. It's here to stay. As I said, NFT is just another part of cryptocurrency. They will end up trying to regulate it, and they will succeed in regulating some. The interesting thing for me, though, is NFTs and cryptocurrency. For us, it's a small part of our business. Our part of our business is to accumulate the IP, the wealth of imagery uh, that we can then uh, monetize in many different ways. And technology is going to be changing that dramatically. The fact that I have a fabulous archive of Alton John means that, you know, five, 10 years from now, I can construct a performance of Elton John. And it's not holograms. It's a three-dimensional artificial intelligence. We could actually... With our IP, we could actually construct an experience in a large auditorium like the O2, where you can spend an hour, you know, on a film set with Brigitte Bardot. Uh, you can use that IP and artificial intelligence to bring to life the past in an immersive way. You know, five years from now, you might be able to get in the ring with Muhammad Ali. <laughs> That's a frightening thought. Yeah, but the, all these things are possible. Oh, it, it's achievable. Mm. Someone who's been at the helm for for uh, all his life of, of businesses. Um, there was uh, just finally there was a piece about you in the Guardian newspaper, which is a few years ago in two thousand nine, um, <laughs> where, when you left editing the Sunday Times magazine, where you suggested you hadn't joined the queue for an allotment yet. Uh, I, I suspect you haven't put your name down still, and, and probably never will. No, I won't. I mean, it, for me, you, you talked about entrepreneurialism. I've always said that journalists are the greatest entrepreneurs. If you have to go out and find a story, and you have to manif- you have to create the story, and you have to place it in such a such a place that pe- a million people will read it, that makes you an entrepreneur. If you switch the word story to product, and you switch the placement to marketing, and getting a million people to buy into it, uh, that makes you an entrepreneur. And not many journalists would agree with me, but what do you do when you go into the office every day? You're looking for a story. When I went in and entered the magazine, I was looking, what am I going to fill it with? That's entrepreneurialism. And um, my attitude was very simple. Journalists are entrepreneurs. Um, they should be moving out of print media uh, and, and creating their own media. I mean, there's no reason why today a fine journalist cannot create their own 
their own website, their own blog, their own videogram, their own podcast, and literally earn a wage that is a good wage and build a business around their expertise and their knowledge. Nobody needs um, a, a, a printed page anymore. I mean, getting journalists to do that and I mean, enlightening to the prospect of what they can do with their knowledge and their expertise is, is, is the tough bit. And our thanks to, uh, to Robin Morgan for uh, talking to us about what all manner of stuff. Um, iconic images, NFTs. It's been fascinating. We'll, of course, have links on the show page today. Right. We haven't got a book of the week this week, have we? I don't think. No. However, I do want to just quickly talk about a book I was sent. Oh, right. Really a okay. Book of the week is a photographer friend of mine called Robin Chun. Okay. Oh, um, I know Robin Chun. You know Robin as well. Well, uh, not not probably as well as you, but yes, I do know Robin Chun. He's been on a couple of my workshops and stuff from yeah. Bristol. Yeah. A, lo- a lovely, a lovely um, guy and a good photographer. Yeah. He anyway, is. he sent me his uh, his book and it's called Outside of This and Inside of That. I don't, I don't think oh, it's I something you'll be able to buy, but I might be wrong. Um, search for Robin Chun. He's in the Facebook group. Yeah. And it's another series. It's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm mo- it's, it's certainly not a zine because it's not a pamphlet. It's right. a, it's a proper book. But it's really nice, you know. There's, there's loads of uh, street photos. Some of the locations I recognise, and then some nice little kind of um, quotes with it. So, for example, there's one here at the I don't know what it's called in Bristol. It's not the the, the Millennium Eye. They've got one of those carousels. You know. Oh, when, I know. Oh, you're going I, and yeah, get terrified no, 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 I, know the, I know the one you mean. Anyway, he's got that, and there's a lady walking past there, and he's called it the Windmills of My Mind. Which oh. I thought was quite nice. Yeah, lots of lots of um, really nice kind of. Uh, a lot of silhouette work, as as is kind of common these days yeah. in street photography, um, but really nice process in and really nice thought process put towards the the light and composition. Um, so yeah, thanks for that, Robin. I've had that on my desk for a few weeks, and I, I kept meaning to mention it. So check out Robin on Instagram or on the Facebook page, or whatever, if you want to find it. Um, it's interesting looking at Robin's um, work. He he, do, he does he, he does look for um, I don't know whether he looks for it, but he, he appears to find it some of the most uh, difficult lighting conditions to photograph in and produces these fabulous images from it. That's uh, Bristol for you. He's often out there in the dark. It's not always dark in Bristol, is it? Is, yeah. is it always dark in Bristol? No, it's not. That's true. Mm. It's not an easy place to photograph on the street, Bristol, though, I have to say. Why? It's kind of why I like going there. Because it's you have the, the shopping centre, which is miles away from the, uh, the harbour side, and one of them is either totally dead and the other one is busy or the, other, or the opposite way around. And you don't get... Because Bristol is an old city, yes. not many people. I mean, there is a lot of people who work in the centre of Bristol, but not many do. So during the week, it's really quite quiet. Um, oh. And a lot of people don't go into the shopping centre anymore because they built the uh, Cabot Circus. So they go there. Like people go to Cabot Circus, but we don't go in, can't go in and photograph in there. Um, but like generally out on the streets and stuff, not so mm. much going on. But they do have, the, I love the Christmas steps. I love that place. Really nice. It's like walking down Dargan Alley. Oh, yeah, it is, isn't it? Very yeah, much, great, yeah. Great little place. <laughs> wow. So, we spend I mean, ages there on the workshops. <laughs> that's it. You, yeah. If you if you want to know where Kev is in Bristol, yeah. it's, it's there. Uh, it does. It looks very much like that. You expect uh, there not to be a door at the end. You have to go in a little in and then find the find the secret way through. There we yeah. go. Uh, right. Questions. Uh, you going first or me? Uh, I'll go. I got one from James Souls. He says, "Hi, I was wondering what the normal process is when doing charity photo work. Yeah. Do you put a basic contract in place? I have a detailed contract in place for my wedding work, but I was unsure about when working with charity. I have agreed to do a series of free photo sessions for a local charity over the rest of this year, and ask that they sign a contract that, in essence, does not say much more than this: they and I can use the photos. I will edit the photos in my normal style. No guarantee on number of photos delivered." The dates I will be photographing for them, and I am not liable, i.e. these are the dates I will be photographing for them. I am not liable if my gear breaks down. <laughs> uh, all pretty basic stuff. Am I being over the top by putting the basic contract in place? No, I, I think we, we talked about contracts, didn't we? And we talked about it in the Patreon uh, one as well. No, I don't, I don't think you are. I think it's a good idea. And and also, um, there was a, an interesting four-letter word in there called free, wasn't it? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I think free. actually set, setting out your um, setting your stall out and saying, you know, if I'm doing this free, yeah, these th- th- there have to be so because I think charity or whatever you what you don't want is this sort of decisions by a committee coming your way and you think, hang on a minute, what did I let myself in for? 
I mean, there there was me, James Souls, with a charitable head on, and suddenly I've given myself a real problem. Somebody wants this, somebody wants that. They can't use that. I can't use this. So I think it's a good idea. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I think also I would probably enhance the contract a little bit with things like liability and all of that kind of stuff that you've probably already got in your wedding contract because, yes, it's fine to do the, the work for free if that's, if that's what you want to do. Mm. But you still do need to be covered because... Uh, you know, if somebody trips over your camera bag or something like that and breaks their leg, you know, all of that, you, you still want that to be uh, covered in your contract. But yeah, ultimately, the, you know, yes, if you're doing it for free, then really the um, uh, the decisions on kind of, you know, when or how many I, I deliver, what they look like, etc., should be down to you, I believe. Yeah. 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 yeah pu- public liability, by the way, I've, I've noticed a few conversations in forums uh, where it's been suggested that people are asking for 10 million cover now because it was always five million certainly a dookie the uh, the um, agreement i have is a is a five million cover yeah well mine's i used to have two million then it went up to five million you're right and i i'm not sure if i have been asked for 10 million yet i mean i i do often get often asked by the venues to send over my contract and yeah. nobody's come back and said it's not enough so yeah i don't know but i think i'm at five million as well I'm yeah if it's a standard one kev um five. i think i think it's five yeah and 10 million for uh, em- uh, employees of yours what i thought one day was um I often think about this, actually, is tripping over my own bag and suing myself. <laughs> I'm not sure that works, <laughs> but... Well, it might do. Hey, listen, why don't we do a number on each other? Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Hey? You come around my wedding, I'll trip you up. I'll yeah. go around your wedding, you hit me over the head with a tripod or something. Well, we'll, are split, you gonna, the, we'll split the we'll split the. Rewards. I'm going to split your head open with that. <laughs> you don't want to be hit with a tripod, Kev. Can't we just go for something that's just... Mildly hurting, um, <laughs> not something where we're going to end up in. Well, it's got to be pretty bad, isn't it? Because I'm not, sh- I'm yeah. not sure we should be having this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's humour. Mike Marin has written in. Hello, gents. QQ. What's the benefit of formatting a- an SD card? I've never done it and wondered if I'm missing an important function. Thanks, <laughs> Mike Marin from Oakville, Ontario, in, in, in uh, Canada, of course. I can't believe you've never formatted one, Mike. I mean, how do you end up with a clean card? Do you just delete the images off the card, putting them in I would the... imagine when he sticks the card in his computer, he, he cuts them off rather than copies them off. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's and then, and then, doing things, and, Mike. And, and then maybe at the end, you just slide them all into the recycle uh, bin. Or, yeah. And that's format, what you're doing. Format, yeah. format, format, format. And always format in camera, never on your computer. Yeah, so why should why should you format, Kev? Let's be clear about this. Well, you shouldn't. You don't have to format until you know. I would say that if you don't format, obviously you can allow the camera, the, the memory card to be full. So it could be he's got a one terabyte memory card and he's never had to get. It's never been full. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, in which case, no, there's no need to format because you're still you know using the images. However, when it gets full, it is better to format it because it's going to reallocate the space correctly in the file allocation table. FAT to people in the know, rather than, uh, you know, if you just cut it, if you stick it in your computer and then drag the images off, it's not going to be um, reallocating the um, the file allocation table properly. doesn't mean that anything will necessarily go wrong. It's a little bit like having your, you know, never washing your windows in your living room. Yeah. Eventually, you won't be able to see out of them. Um, one thing you must never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever, never, never, ever do, Mike, is delete pictures from your camera as you're going along. Yeah, try and avoid that. Well, it's a quick way of corrupting a card. Well, I say a quick way. People do corrupt cards that way, don't they? Yeah, you've got more chance of something going wrong for sure. Just leave the image there and, you know, no. just don't use it rather than delete it off the memory card. This file allocation table, FAT, there's a mm-hmm. FAT32, isn't there? And then yeah. there's another, and they, these are the different, so there's two different NTFS. ways. NTFS. Uh, that's it. So the two different ways uh, that, that Mac and Windows work and why when you plug in, a hard drive from your Windows to a Mac, it will read it, but you can't write onto it. I don't know if it works the other way with, with Windows. How does it work the other way around, Kev? It works fine the other way around. The reason why if you stick a, uh, a PC formatted drive into a Mac and it doesn't work is because it's a Mac. <laughs> now, I, w- I was hoping we'd get to uh, an answer without you having a go at Mac. <laughs> well, no, it's just because they make it more difficult, don't they? They want to use their own... Oh, I laugh my, my little... Um, What's it? Moves off <laughs> when what? when uh, the EU the EU said uh, yeah everybody's got to use a universal cable from now on. I was like ah 
<laughs> Did they really say that? Yeah, from 2024, all mobile devices like tablets, iPads, phones, uh, any chart, anything, vapes, every, you know, whatever, anything, I think has got to, has got to use USB C. So the USB, yeah, wow. I mean, which is brilliant. The amount of waste, the amount of waste created by cables. Can I just know. can I just say though, Kev, in Apple's defence here, my new iPad uses USB C, and I believe they're going that way. I think you'll find that it's an it Thunderbolt USB C, which is slightly different. Oh, is it? I think so. Oh. I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure. I'm, I'm happy to be put wrong that way. However, regardless, it's not just Apple. Of course, there's loads of them who do it. Yeah. What will happen, I suspect, is that the devices will no longer come with a charger, and they will say, you know, you buy your own charger, and and but that's great. You know, just having one charger well, it doesn't matter because you use the same charger. Yeah, same charger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think th- it's a brilliant thing. Um, well done, EU. Finally, <laughs> but you, you have forgotten one thing that's really very important in this conversation, Kev. Mm. We are not part of the. <laughs> yeah. No, it doesn't. Affect, it doesn't come to us. No, that's right. Britain, <laughs> uh, Lady Truss has already said they're not thinking about in, implementing uh. that. But yes, but what? Of course, it will ripple down, though, won't it? Because there's there's no way that you know Dell, Apple, Microsoft, all of that are going to uh, you know supply one plug to Europe and then a different one here. It will, by virtue of yeah. you know, just the heuristics yeah. of life, it will it will come yeah. to the UK. Yeah, which will make sense. Right, your go, Kev, from the Book of Face. I have a question here from Kevin Beecham. Been a while since I popped in here, but I have a question referencing the zoom on the X100V. Is there any way I can keep my camera set on 50 millimeters as when I turn off the camera, it resets to 35 mil unless I leave it on and use the power save. I know that I can assign the zoom to a focus ring. But I like to shoot in manual and use back button focus. And the answer is no. Oh. Uh, as far as I'm aware, Kevin, you can't. It will reset it unless I don't know whether that was something that they addressed in a firmware update. Don't know. I know it was something that a lot of people have asked for. So it might've been something that was on their radar. So double check latest firmwares and stuff like that. But as far as I'm aware, no, certainly wasn't at launch. Here's a weird way to think of something, Kev. Now that you've come back from Japan, while you were in Japan, did you ask the question whether that's possible for Kev and others that would like to do it that way? That's kind of a bit of a life on Mars moment from that television program isn't it did you ask what, this, this tcl question yeah did did you ask the question for him i might have done <laughs> and 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 my my previous self is thinking i might do <laughs> okay right uh questions uh, peter foot good morning guys on an episode i was listening to you were prompting for more questions so i've been thinking about writing so here we go i'm in the market in the next few months for a pocketable, high-quality point-and-shoot camera so I can catch those unexpected moments and use it as an EDC. EDC? Am I missing something here? I'm awful with things like this. Extra digital camera. I don't know. Perhaps. Don't know. I currently have an I. I, I know you're shouting at us now, Peter, saying, EDC, don't you know? I currently have an iPhone 12, and I'm really happy with the images it produces, but the ergonomics are not suited to my style of photography, and in particular, those unexpected moments that present themselves. Currently, I'm moving toward the Ricoh GR3, uh, original version with the 28mm equivalent, but I'm also interested in what else is out there, possibly in the future. What about the Fuji uh, X70? Is that likely to be updated? Although I have heard, I read it somewhere, that Fuji are not planning to manufacture any more small cameras in the future is that true well in the past kev for the future did you ask that question i think i think that uh they're probably quite sick of the x70 question however <laughs> i know i know for a fact there are uh, thousands and thousands i'm going to round it up to about 85 million people right if it helps that would uh that would love to see an x80 however I think the answer will always be we shall consider. Mm. Uh, and, and the reason for that, and Peter kind of touched on it really, is because it is competing too much ah. in that camera phone marketplace, you know, and, and that's, that is, everybody has a camera phone, you know, and, mm. and I think a really truly pocketable um, point and shoot, if you like, is niche. Uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd love, I, I would love, you know, the Ricoh is a great little camera. Yeah. Um, the X70 was a wonderful camera, still is. The XF10 was also a brilliant camera. Um, both of which they don't sell any longer. Yeah. Um, and the X70, I think, would, uh, there was issues, you know, the um, the factory that made the sensors fell into the sea after the earthquake. So that, that was a big issue for that. Yeah. But uh, it didn't really become uh, popular because the problem with the X70 was it was released on this, it was launched on the same day as the X Pro 2. Uh, and it was announced and it wasn't leaked or anything like that. So it just kind of came under the radar. 
And it took several months for people, street photographers specifically, to, to, to realize it was such a gem. And marketing wise, I think they possibly got it wrong in that it was, it was aimed at your kind of John Lewis purchaser rather than your, uh, you know, your professional photographer, you know. So I think there was, there was issues with that that probably made them think, oh, you know, is it worth investing time and effort into this mm-hmm. kind of format again? That said, never say never because, you know, if we, if we rattle a cage enough, I'm hoping at some point somebody will, will listen. They, you know, they went ahead with the XF10, which which was a reasonable camera until it got dark. You know, I I I I, I didn't buy one, but I had one on loan and, and I enjoyed using it. But the X70 is uh, yeah, it's a dream camera, iconic. We're on, you know talking about iconic things, yeah. iconic camera. Yeah, it, it, um, EDC by the way is everyday carry. Everyday camera. There you go. Yeah, and no everyday and, carry. Everyday Karen. No. <laughs> Everyday carry. Oh, you carry. sure it's not everyday camera? Carry, love, carry. Uh, well, well, as in anyway, what you carry yeah, around with you. The 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 uh, the X seventy is truly EDC. Yep. Whatever that is, even it's smaller than my phone. I don't obviously don't have an iPhone. I've got a um, one plus something. Are you still on Huawei? Huawei, 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 Huawei? No, my Huawei, Huawei, Huawei finally gave up the ghost. But I've I've still got my Huawei, 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 Huawei watch. But um, I now have a one plus. I'm trying no, is it? Oh, oh God, I don't know. Anyway, if you do have a Huawei, 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 and you're trying to get into Vero, there are some um, there are some complications with that now, of course, aren't there? Get into, get into what? Vero. Um, the uh, are you not a Vero man yet? Oh, the new Instagram thing. Well, it's not really. New, I have it? I have an account. Yeah, yeah, but apparently that doesn't work on. Uh, there's there's a few apps now that don't work on Huawei, 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 Huawei. Yeah, it was the best phone I ever had. Mm. And, you know, again, that was a, well, I'm not allowed to say, I'll get in loads of trouble, but let's just say I believe there was a, a, a collusion between a certain massive company named after a fruit <laughs> and, a, and a certain um, president. Also named after a fruit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you eat too much of it. <laughs> yeah, uh, anyway, whatever. But yes, so I'm still trying to find out what I've got because it's a lovely little phone, actually. Hang on. You have no idea who makes your phone. No, because I just went and got it off the um off the phone shop. But it's fantastic. It's it's fantastic phone. Hang on, a big yeah. device. Um, but when you got this, Oppo phone, Oppo, Oppo Find X Five Pro. Right. Okay. That's uh, what it's called. What, what a going back to everyday carry. Um, what an X. I think it's everyday camera. Do you? Well, yeah. I've looked on YouTube and all the cool kids are saying everyday carry. But anyway, it could be they, camera. They smoke dope. <laughs> you can't just. Oh, dear. What bits are we editing out, lawyer? All right. All of it? Should we put this episode out? No. Okay. Um, Would the X100V be considered an everyday carry or camera? (laughs) Um, Yeah. I mean, I suppose it depends on how big your everyday pockets are, really. But, um, yeah, I I mean, it would be wrong for me to say I take my X100V with me everywhere because I don't. If I'm, you know, if I'm just running and, and... you know, going out for the day, that's the camera I t- typically would reach for. Yeah, I mean, I'm measuring it now against my Oppo X5 Pro thingamajiggy, and my X100V is much shorter than my phone. Yeah. It's a little bit less high, but obviously it's much deeper. So wouldn't... Well, would, th- yeah, this... It would go in my back jeans pocket, yeah, put it that way. It goes in uh, along with Peter, because uh, Peter had a, just an extra power here where he said, I'd be interested to hear your recommendations, what you use as your EDC. Um, I currently have a Fuji XE4. And one, one of the lenses, he says, um, I use is the 40mm equivalent pancake, and that's great, but ultimately not really pocketable. My requirement is for it to be jean pocket or jeans pocketable, not winter coat pocketable necessarily. Okay. I, also, I also need it to be one-handed operation, no lens cap, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, that puts the X100V probably out because... Well, I, yeah. I'm not sure because I mine goes in my back pocket of my jeans quite comfortably. What, um, your, your X100? Yeah, 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 because I've got a massive (laughs) arse. I'm sorry I spoke over you there. I wish we could have heard that more clearly. You heard it here first. But, yeah, it it wouldn't comfortably go in my front Mm. jeans pocket. But certainly would go in coats and and inside. You know, like I often, if I'm using it at a wedding, it usually goes on the inside pocket of my jacket. Yeah. You know, the the, the pocket that you'd normally put your reading glasses and all that kind of stuff in. I know you won't like this, but I, for an EDC, I wish I had the... I wish I'd, I wish I had the cash for it right now, but I really, really, I know you don't. I know, you, I know you're going to shiver when I say it, but I love the look of um, of the pictures coming out of the new 
iPhone 14. No comment. That fell. No, I agree. I mean, I agree. You know, let's let's face it. AI digitally processed images in cameras is fantastic, and it's only getting better. I mean, I use my my this thing, whatever it is, again to take loads of pictures. Yeah. You know, it'd be churlish and and uh, completely lying to say that we don't. And you can't you can't compare them in terms of like professional tools and all of that kind of stuff. You, know, no. you just I just don't don't think we're there yet, but. The camera manufacturers do certainly have this something snapping at their heels that they need to, you know, need to to kind of address. And I, I, I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect what we'll see over the next generation of cameras is that the, uh, you know, the physics of the camera it cannot change that much in terms of, you know, light hits a sensor. But I think it will be the computational power inside cameras that will be the next major leap if you like and you know and i've said it before this idea of taking a picture 5g in it up and it's in your inbox already and that you know i think that's that, that's that's what i would like to see happen well we learned a new acronym anyway god i, I can't everyday karen <laughs> everyday karen i've got an i've got an edg at home <laughs> an everyday Gemma. oh yeah yeah how is how is how is our favorite Gemma in the whole wide widest world yeah she's lovely Good. Bit of a stressful time for us all at the moment. Yeah. No no bathroom. We've got a Spanish student living with us. What? I'm, I'm abroad all the time. And um, yeah. How come like you've that. got no bathroom and you've got people staying with you from Spain? What are you doing? Well, we, we've got up? a functioning bathroom. We're having no bathroom redone. Ah. But because we're in Britain and uh, it's very hard to get anything done, oh. and it's very hard to get anything sourced and stuff like that. So it's just taken a long time. Have you um, ever, ever thought about going to one of those stores like the Bath Store, Kev? You find they have a lot outside uh, and in the back and the back room that you can just yeah, plumb in. We did think about it. <laughs> so, but what are you doing? Are you building a bath or something? No, no, no. We got John the plumber, very nice guy. He's into his photography. He's yeah. a good photographer, in fact. Um, and, and certainly not him. You know, it, it's just it's just getting things. You know, and and also what you have to remember. I'm being a little bit cruel to britain really but what you have to remember is we live in a like nearly 400 year old cottage and yeah. nothing is straight no. you know and pipes and things like that and yeah so it's all it's a bit of a challenge is john the plumber um, one of those plumbers that only breathes in never breathes out <laughs> Ooh, i don't know if i could do this for you that's gonna be at least another 500 quid yeah he's a really nice guy he is your typical he's a big guy big beard you know <laughs> uh, i often see him kind of in yeah. the pub and stuff like that john the beard um, <laughs> but he's a uh, yeah he's a he's a true honest working bloke. Right. Nice right. guy. We we've, we've got time for a QQ but before we do that a quick um uh, parting mention for um uh, the the one the wonderful pick time pick-time.com who uh, are supporting us on the podcast. We both use them. We love them. Uh, if you need galleries to show your work and sell your work and then you use it even better than um, that, than I've thought of using it, Kevin. That you uh, you program anniversaries, don't you? Yeah. So uh, you and and also when you say program, you don't. It's not complicated. That's the best thing about it. It really isn't complicated. I mean, you can you can you can get quite funky with the automations and you know do some some pretty cool stuff. But ultimately, it is it is very very straightforward. Mm. Um, and the and the the automations are multiple things. So you could do, for example. 10% off first month or you could um it, you know you can set it up so that when new visitors turn up after a couple of days it will send them an email it will do like abandoned cart stuff um it, it's just great you know really is really is very very cool and regardless of course they are helping us out on the podcast for a couple of months but uh we you know we do both use it so I've been using it for a long time in fact i copied you <laughs> it was you it was you what did it is it my fault yeah. Um, go to pick-time.com and at checkout, uh, go Fujicast, all upper case, Fujicast, and you will get one month of freeness. And everybody needs a bit of freeness in their life, don't they? Freeness is lush. Yeah. Um, right, let's have a QQ. Um, of course, uh, next week is our patron-only show, isn't it? Um, it's the uh, the extra little bit we do for, for the patrons. Patron pop-up. And uh, I wonder whether this will work, Kev. I'm just saying, off the top of my head here, and you might be thinking, oh, Neil, that's never going to work, really. While you are in Japan, why don't, why don't we try and link up and do, like, five minutes on stuff that you might have seen? Uh, OK. Am I going to regret that? Because I have to get up at a horrible time of day to do the call. There's that. Um, 
But yeah, we can we can try it. I'm yeah. not sure how the audio will come out, but we can try it. Well, uh, come on, we're talking to somebody. You know, J- Japan is a, a leading tech giant country. Yeah, well, I'm not going to go and buy a microphone right there and then not bring it home. No, I'm not thinking <laughs> I'm about that. I'm not taking one with me. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking about putting you on the end of a Zoom line, Kev. Yeah, I'll have my laptop. Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. We can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, um, I will treat... It'll have to be Saturday or Sunday and it'll have to be about half past three in the morning, your time. What? <laughs> <laughs> Let me have a look at my calendar and see what I is doing. What are you doing? Um, next Saturday. Are you doing anything with the EDC, the EDS? No, I'm collecting <laughs> M&T from HTW. M&T from HTW. Mum and Trev oh. from Heathrow. Uh, yeah. You're always going to the airport to pick them up. Uh, they're coming back from South, them- South Africa. Oh, right. They're, I mean, they are. <laughs> it's, that's always on a plane. I don't tell my friend Greta. She'd hate it. No. Um, yeah, let's try and do that then. Let's try and do that. And then on, on Sunday, I could probably do that as well. My diary's really empty, Kev. It's looking a bit grim. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's do a QQ, and then that's yeah. it for this show. You or me? Uh, you, it's your turn. Facebook. Book of Mike face. Wooden, uh, question for the Brains Trust. When does an image cease yeah. to be a photograph and become digital art? Uh, the most popular definition I have found for... Uh, photograph is photography is the process of recording an image a photograph on light sensitive film or in the case of digital photography via a digital electronic magnetic memory definition of digital art is digital art is artwork created similarly similarly to drawings and <laughs> paintings Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But, <laughs> but through digital technology yeah. which is often f- through devices like tablets and computers see my problem with this is somebody somebody had to decide that and that somebody <laughs> who was that somebody that said right i'm telling you what digital art is and i'm telling you what photography is and you can't move outside these parameters because i wrote them so I, I i don't know i mean I had norman this, his name was it was it norman i had this yeah. discussion the other day actually on on the other podcast um and i i said well is a painting not a painting because you decided to use a bit of mixed media in there when when does a painting not become a painting there's there's plenty of art, very good artists that uh, atop their oil that goes onto canvas they stick stuff in it and is it no longer a painting yeah i mean if you're if you're taking it right down to the to the bare bones of it the definition of a photograph is light sensitive paper exposed to light and mm. nothing else happens to it so in other words di- digital photos aren't photography because it's just one it, by the definition of it no because they've been the, you know they will have been processed in the camera yeah i mean the raw file less so but you know if you then go and do anything to the raw file then is that is that transcending the boundaries from photography to digital art i i mean i i'm not a big fan of overly obvious photographs you know when smiles have been photoshopped on and all you know that kind of stuff yeah that doesn't mean that it, i think it's right or wrong to do that there's time and place for everything yeah. i you know I, I like what i like that might not be the same thing as my everyday karen likes <laughs> well that's <laughs> and that's a good way to end the show and uh, that's it um well I, I hope you had a lovely time in uh uh, in japan kev it's re- weird saying that because you're you're just about to get on an airline or actually go out but actually you're coming 15 back. 15 hours 15 why is it 15 hours kev it was can't never fly fif- over russia anymore oh we've got to go via manchester and then down <sighs> by Leeds and then isle of man so it's a bit longer why can't that man just gently disappear somewhere <laughs> oh, just just go take a holiday. Go and in, just enjoy retirement or something. Leave it to the grown-ups to uh, to sort out. Anyway, I won't get too political. So 15, 15 hours. But it's just as well then, Kev, that the, the, they're flying you there and back in uh, first class. With, with I understand, I, I have no idea that they now have jacuzzis on board. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, I, I don't think Kev has ever turned right when he's uh, when he's got onto an airline. I'm turning right this week. <laughs> <Are> believe <you? laughs> me. Yeah, I'm turning right, believe me. Oh, you'll be sniffing yeah. the seat to be saying, I don't want to sit in that one. I don't want to... Yeah. Have you heard that thing that uh, happens uh, at one of the American airlines? Apparently, they have a joke amongst the... Uh, uh, amongst the uh, the the, uh, the uh, air crew when they go through the cabin at the end uh, near the end of the flight when they're just taking the um, all the rubbish um, from people you know they hold out the bag uh, they they walk along the um, they walk along the aisle and say you're trash you're trash you're trash 
your tra- <laughs> getting their own back. Well, yeah. um, safe, happy flights. I know it's a long one, and um, hopefully we'll uh, we'll link up to do the the, the Patreon pop up. Um, even if I do have to get up at th- three o'clock in the morning, are you sure, Kev? Three o'clock in the morning? No, it's probably not that. But I will make you get up at three o'clock in the morning. Anyway. <laughs> You're just being cruel. Uh, I have no idea. It's like a twelve-hour time difference. I don't. I really don't know. All I know is we fly at fly at seven p.m. and arrive at six p.m. the next day. <laughs> Oh, Coming yeah. back, yeah. we fly at eight AM yeah. and arrive at two o'clock the same that afternoon. <laughs> it's confusing, isn't it? Is That's there confusing. is there life on Mars? Cue the song. See you, see you soon, Kev. Bye. Bye. The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk. Email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way.